love our prophetic intercessors, you know, that are getting pictures and visions. And how many know just because you've been given position doesn't mean that you occupy the space of authority? Right? And how many know that, that we have been called to be a, a, a lamp on a hill stand, you know, on a, a lamp on a, a mountain, and, and to proclaim light? And so when, when I got that word, I feel like, um, especially when it comes to the election, this, this election is very, very critical. It's probably the most critical one for Canadian history that we're facing because of what's at stake for it. And we were in Ottawa last week with the cry with Fatine. And, um, and, and we believe that as the church, if we stay passive and you don't take your realm of authority, we could lose ground. That's just the way it works. Passivity permits things to come in and to take occupy, occupation. Now, Regardless of the outcome of the election, there's going to be a win-win. Either we're going to get persecuted or we're going to get more years of freedom. But either one, we win. But that's what's on the line, is that there is a level of persecution that could come to the church with this next election. And so there was a generation that did rise up in the, in the Second World War that, that went to battle against an ideology that was sweeping the land. They sacrificed, they laid down their lives, and we get to the blessing of being able to live in that freedom and, and my generation's never been faced with a conflict like that. You know, I've never seen a, a time period in history where my children had to go to war. I'm living in the freedom that my kids aren't going to war, and when I send them out the door wondering whether they're going to come back or not. There was a generation that did that. And there was a generation that didn't have their children come back, or they did come back and they weren't the same. And so I'm just... We live in a freedom of democracy. It says that uh, they were saying that only 30% of the Canadians vote, um, which to me seems like a slap in the face to the generation that laid down their life. I know there's lots of different reasons why people don't vote. You know, one can be passivity. One can be, I just don't know who to vote for. I'm not sure. It can also be just, um, you know, oh, well, it's all in God's hands, you know. Let's just, let's just let it all play out the way it's going to play out. Yes, there's an element of truth that, but if that generation didn't say our children are going to go to war, we wouldn't have this, right? So I just want to, I, we, we live in a blessing, we live in a pocket, but, but there's a, we're in a critical time. And, and, and uh, there is an alarm bell that's been sent out, and, um, and let's just not assume that it's all going to be the same the way that it is. So, so, if, so let's just stand together. Come on up, Beth. So uh, I wasn't going to share this, but it really goes with this morning, um, with Joyce's sharing. During worship, I was really struggling over all the circumstances with my kids not walking with God, with, with the elections, with different things. Um, and my, my grandson went to his hockey game yesterday, and... They had a shout out, these, these little guys, you know, but I really noticed while they were playing, uh, they're like eight-year-olds, nine-year-olds, and I noticed they were playing very defensively and just trying to chase the other team, but not offensively. So while I'm worshiping this morning, that first song was so speaking to me, one about the power of worship, and, the, and Paul and Silas in prison, beaten and locked up, but they worshiped and prayed. So I'm praising in spite of all these concerns and saying, God, do something. Like, where is your power? We need your power. And I felt like he said, you're waiting on me, and I'm waiting on you. And he gave me this scripture in Exodus 14 where Moses got on his face crying out to God because the enemy was really moving in and they had mountains on both sides, a sea in front. And God said, what are you doing on your face crying out to me? Stand up and take your authority. And uh, he's given us authority. And what we bind on earth is bound in heaven. And it's like... Use what I've given you. Put the enemy under your feet. Walk in your power. Walk in your authority. And believe God. And watch what he's going to do.
just stay up here for a second. Okay, so putting all this together, Joyce shared, you know, that a lion would roar into the ground. And, um, and, and yes, we can stir things within this region, uh, you know, for this election, but it's, it's really across Canada is what we're, what we're contending for. And so I just want to go into a moment of where we just take, where we just pray, just intercede. Well, let's put our prayers right into the ground. And can you imagine that, that metaphor, right, of a lion roaring into the ground and it shakes the nation of Canada into alignment with the heart of God and the plans that he has for this nation. He has good plans for us, a huge vision for us to be a strong nation that lends to other nations. We could be a nation that can help developing nations get established instead of sending, us their, sending them money so they abort their generations to come. Like, we could do this whole thing the opposite direction from the way we have been doing it. And so, um, let's both pray into it. So, Father, we just stand in a place. We, we stand in our position in Christ. We also take the authority that you've given to us, and we declare into the ground now that your plans and your purposes for this nation would come forward in the name of Jesus. We pray for the sound of the church to reverberate the ground of this nation, Lord. We pray for people tomorrow, when they go to the voting, even if they've undecided, Lord, steer them in the direction that aligns with your heart for Canada, we pray in Jesus' name. And we pray, God, that, that your kingdom would come and your will would be done. Lord, we pray in faith. We pray in faith that when we ask, we receive. And we thank you, Lord, that you hear our cries. We thank you. Your word says you listen intently. And thank you, Lord, you're listening intently. You've been waiting for us to pray prayers of faith and victory because your word says there's nothing too difficult for you. So, Lord, we believe you. We believe you, and we thank you for that in our agreement, Lord, we bind the tactics of the enemy. We take authority over the darkness that is trying to triumph over Canada, and we say no more, and we push back the powers of darkness in the name of Jesus, and we command you, get off our land. Get off our land in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And the blood of Jesus is over us. And we declare that God Almighty is for us. So who can be against us? And we thank you, Lord, for the victory. We thank you for the victory over sickness and disease, over demonic influence, and everything that is not of God. We say, no, you can't have us. You can't have our children. You can't have our land in Jesus name and we declare he our God shall have dominion from sea to sea in Jesus name thank you Lord yes amen and the Bible also says that we're to bless and, and, and pray for our leaders, those that are in authority, because the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. And so we lift up Prime Minister Justin Trudeau to you today, God. We pray for your spirit to be upon him. We pray that you would touch his heart, that you would give him counsel and leadership for this nation. And Lord, we pray that you would have an encounter with him like never before. We pray that, um, that the church would be a safe place for Justin to come into, Lord. I pray that he would find love. I pray that he'd find acceptance. And Jesus, we pray for whoever this next leader that is gonna come into position, we are gonna pray for them and bless them. In Jesus' name, amen. And everyone said? Amen. Go vote. Go vote. <laughs> okay, we, we did it. If you could switch uh, my PowerPoint over to the computer, that'd be wonderful. Thanks, guys. And. Wonderful. So uh, Leslie and I got back from the Dominican. John got back yesterday. Um, hi, John. And uh, we had a great time there. It was, um, it was uh, the Catch the Fire World Leaders Advance. They do it twice, uh, twice well, once every two years. And they gather all their world leaders from around the world. And, and I was just blown away at what God has done through John and Carol back in 1981, who planted this church, and then 1992, I think it was, right? Or 88. When, when did you plant Toronto? Was it 88? 88. 
So in 1988, planted Toronto, and then in 1994, you know, had a suddenly moment where the Lord's presence showed up and has influenced the world. It's incredible. I mean, I'm just sitting there watching it and looking at, at leaders from all, you know, a bunch of different nations, not all the nations, not yet, pretty soon, but lots of nations sitting there and just encountering the presence of God. And um, it was just such a, a beautiful moment for Leslie and I, and uh, we really enjoyed our time. And so it really kind of stirred my heart this morning as to what we're going to be speaking about. So if you can jump into Acts 9, verse 1. I have a couple verses on, on overhead as well. But we're going to begin. Um, so this is the story of Paul on the road to Damascus. And, um, and as he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone upon him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And so here's Saul, Paul, Saul, who was one of the most incredible religious leaders. I mean, he, out of all of them, was the most educated, smartest. He could have recited the laws inside and out, and he had it down. In fact, he was such an amazing religious leader that these Christians that are kind of messing with the Jewish traditions and that, that are a problem, he was like the chief persecutor of them. In fact, he'd kill them. And so in his perspective, in his eyes, he was doing God a favor. He thought, you know, I'm fulfilling a mandate to keep the zealous Christians out of the way of preserving the purity of the law. And then on the road to Damascus, he has this encounter. And it was a, it was a strong encounter. Like it struck him to a point where he was blind. He couldn't see, and for a couple days he couldn't eat. And so he's, he's left helpless, you know, waiting for somebody to come along and rescue him. Can you imagine being in a place like that? Where you're struck blind and you're, you're taken out and you're, you're kind of crawling, it, like totally disorientating. And then you hear this voice in the voice of Jesus himself. And the sound of his voice is, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? If you can jump over to Luke 24. The story is, um, Jesus is, you know, he was crucified. And the disciples are all hanging out and they're really grieving. They're really upset because this is the man that they've given their whole life for. They've given up their occupations, followed him. He moved in signs, wonders, miracles. He had confrontation with the religious. He had confrontation with the political. And, uh, but they, they, they knew that he was the one. Their expectation was that he was going to rise up and overthrow the government, overthrow the religious systems into new liberties. But it seemed like this was a point of defeat because his life was taken away. And so, you know, they're, they're kind of in this place of despair. And uh, Jesus actually walks up beside them and starts hanging out with them, asking them questions. This is earlier than the scripture verse I'm referring to. And they don't even recognize him. You know, and then later they're in a room together, and then he all of a sudden appears to them. And, uh, and it says, and just as they were telling about him, they were talking amongst themselves, Jesus himself was suddenly standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. But the whole group was startled and frightened, thinking they were seeing a ghost. Can you imagine? Encounter. You know, um, how many have had an encounter with the Lord before? How many have had a father's encounter? Where maybe you grew up with a father that, or maybe didn't have a father, and uh, misrepresented the character, kindness, and likeness of God, and then you had this encounter with him where the revelation of his character and kindness and goodness overwhelmed you, thinking, how could a God... You know, and this isn't with your head, even though we talk about it, but this is with your heart. Your heart comes to the realization that he loves me. Not because of what I do or what I've done, but he loves me. And that his goodness and his... And how many have had an encounter with Jesus before where the love and the radiant, you know, it's like all my sins have been washed completely clean. Like I feel like I've just had the, the, the shower of the lifetime, you know, Everything is spotless. You can see right through me. There's nothing hidden. Or with the Holy Spirit where his presence overwhelms you and you can feel the tingles and you feel the, the warmth and, and it can even bring you to a tear or, or to an understanding or to a revelation. You know, sometimes what can happen um, 
after we've had these experiences and had these encounters with them, you know, when, when we post up, hey, we're going to have a Father Heart conference next weekend, you can say, I've done this before, where you go, oh, been there, done that, check. Or, hey, what about an encounter with Jesus? Oh, been there, done that, you know. Or, or encountering his presence with the Holy Spirit. Oh, been there, done that. I've become a mature Christian. You know, I've, I've gone through the, the training seminar. I've done the schooling, and, and so I've done that. So now let's move, on to, let's move on to the other things of the kingdom, right? Like conquering the world and the neighbors and, and doing all these great exploits for God. None, none of those are wrong, but can you see how in our own hearts there can be this sense of like almost like... Uh, Oh, I've been there. I don't need that. You know, I've, I've had those moments of experience, but I'd like to move on and move forward. Can anybody relate to that? Forms. Can you tell me what, what, are, what are different forms that we have in place that we use? What are some of the forms? Uh, and what I mean by that, a religious form, like a, a structure that we do or a tradition or um, what are some of the forms that are within your life that's within our community? Meeting together, Sunday morning. So coming to church is a form, right? Any other forms that we do? Communion. How many were here for the first service? You guys know all the answers. <laughs> That's why you're holding back. Okay, great. <laughs> what are some of the other forms? Okay, let's do this. What are some of the, the Jewish forms that the Jewish culture would follow? The different feasts. Yeah. Prayer. Covenant. Sabbath. Festivals, different festivals. Are forms bad? Do they, could they become dangerous? Ism? Explain. Here. <laughs> yeah, forms are a means often of posturing ourselves for God's grace. We're a vehicle, but when it becomes an end in itself, and it almost leaves the Lord out of the equation, it becomes an ism, traditionalism. And Jesus in Matthew challenged the religious leaders and said, your traditions of men have super uh, imposed on the word of God. You've nullified the word of God by your traditions, and that's not good. So what happens if we throw all the forms out? None of them. What would happen? Helter-skelter. Be chaos. It'd be difficult, right, to nurture that place of encounter, because I encounter God in worship when his presence comes and I feel him. I encounter him when I take communion. I encounter him when I'm in relationship with you. You know, and I come on a Sunday morning and we're able to connect and be in relationship and carry each other's burdens. There, there's an element of where there's, I feel Christ in that. Um, and also too, uh, you know, when we celebrate Christmas, even though I know it's really but it's a great time of year to, to come into the realization that, that there was a precious gift given to us. You know, Jesus, this little tiny baby. So forms in themselves aren't necessarily bad, but they can become dangerous. Devotions, prayer, reading the Bible. Yeah, there's, it can become a form. It can become a substitute to wear, and disciplines, different spiritual dis disciplines. Why do you think Jesus said this? Matthew 9, 17. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, for the old skins would burst from the pressure, spilling the wine and ruining the skins. New wine is stored in new wineskins so that both can be, are preserved. So let's think about this for a moment. Like he came in a time period where, where the religious had the law down to the point where they, were, they, be, they became professionals with the law. They became part of the elite with the law. Right? So, and, and they would put the weight on people that made it impossible for the people to even... They, they made impossible terms for the people. And so here, here you have the professional elites 
traditions, forms, and Jesus is standing right in front of them, and they don't even recognize him. And then he says this, you can't put new wine into an old wineskin. You know, I think of Paul, right? Like he gets so passionate after he's planted a couple of churches and some of the traditions start coming back in to the church and he goes, who, have, who has bewitched you into believing that these forms of tradition are what give you your salvation? Jesus himself has come before us and has given his life, and we become a new creation so the Gentile and Jew can be grafted in, but you've returned back to what you're familiar with that excludes Christ completely. You know, he was quite, he was very strong. In fact, he, he basically told them to go and emasculate themselves, which was like really strong language for someone. And, um, but there was a conflict in that time period between the traditions, religion, and form and the actual person, Jesus himself. Paul, in this scripture, in 2 Corinthians, says, even though I've received such wonderful revelations from God, so after his experience, I mean, it was wide open. He was, like, just imagine, you know, he's the most religious of the religious, and he has this encounter with God, and now he's like the champion that's leading the charge on the kingdom of heaven and breaking open in the earth. And he's saying, even though I've received such wonderful revelations from God, so to keep me from being proud, I was given a thorn in the flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from, from being proud. How many find that... Um, how many, how many find that in your flesh, your flesh sort of defaults to a certain thing? What are some of the things that your flesh kind of defaults to? Fear? Has anyone ever struggled with pride? How about opinions? My opinion's right, and I'm going to make sure you know it. <laughs> Judgments? Sorry? Looseness of a tongue. Do you know, um, for those that are in the camp that says, been there, done that, had the encounter, let's move on, um, my question to you would be, what kind of fruit are you walking in? Do you struggle with bitterness? Are you struggling with forms of unforgiveness? Are you f struggling with, with being angry, upset, grumpy, sad? Because in the new covenant where, where Jesus is, it's full of joy, it's full of life. And the fruits of the Spirit are opposite to the, uh, the, to the fruits of the flesh. This next scripture in John 15, Jesus says, Remain in me and I'll remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it's severed from the vine, and it cannot be fruitful unless it re remain in me. And so Jesus is talking about being in this place of abiding in him. To where, even though we come and we, we say, we got the perfect song, and let's do it again because it worked last week, and we look to that form to accomplish something, and it falls lifeless and dead at our feet, we haven't come for the song. We've come for him. And when we have an encounter, it's not the encounters we seek. It's the person on the other side of that encounter, isn't it? Jesus and revealing himself to us and abiding. So what are some of the ways that you nurture your relationship with Jesus? What are some of the things that you do? What are some of the things that are life-giving for you? His word, reading the Bible, right? Sorry? Talking to him, hearing, listening to his voice, having a conversation. It's interesting being really real. How many have found that when you're really honest and real in your conversation with him, that it's almost like magnetic for his presence that he ushers in really quickly. You know, I mean, he, he sees right through us. <laughs> you know, on, on one day I can be this beautiful, wonderful, all put together Christian, and then the next day when no one's looking, right? Well, he sees the whole thing, you know? We don't play games with him. We can't put on a show for him, and he sees right through us. But that doesn't, he doesn't hold that against us. That's the crazy part. You know, he still loves us the same, and he wants to draw close to us. What are some other ways that you guys nurture your relationship with Jesus and nurture this, this place of abiding? Worship, like in the car and everywhere. 
all the time. 24 hours, worship. It's true. How many find that? Sometimes, yeah. Here, you can say it into the mic. Oh, Trevor. Yeah, sometimes even when I'm sleeping, I'll be worshiping all night long. And um, even making good, in my dreams, I try to make good choices and bring the Lord in. It's amazing. It's great. I mean, our spirits are still active when we're sleeping. You know, um, I think it was Bill Johnson was saying that he wants to put his spirit to work when he goes to rest. And so he'll, he'll, he'll like speak in tongues and then get his spirit going and then he'll go to sleep. And, uh, but his spirit is still working and communing with the Lord. What are some of the other things that happens? Fellowship? Do you know, one of the things that I do, and I don't know if you can relate to this, is um, how many have found that when you've been fasting that all of a sudden your spirit man kind of gets the, the advantage and kind of rises ahead? Has anyone ever found that? I actually find that when I'm running and where I feel like I'm almost going to die and collapse on the pavement. You know, my body's like saying, what are you doing to yourself? And also my spirit man just rises up and I can feel, actually yesterday when I was out running, I could... The, the sun was coming, and I just felt the overwhelming presence of the Lord. Like, it was almost as if, like, I was in a different place, a different realm. Like, my, my thoughts, my feelings, my emotions, my attention, you know, are not, you know, my mind's not racing on, you know, what I need to do or what I'm concerned about. It's all of a sudden all my gaze is upon him and his beauty and how much he loves me. What are some other things that you guys do? Giving, that's a great one. Being generous. How many have found the absolute pleasure of the Lord in giving a gift? You know, you know why be locked up and feeling afraid and trying to hang on, but, but to be generous and to give? So this morning, the, the point that I want to make is that, you know, we've come here gathered together. And this isn't, you know, a gathering for me to say, hey, we need to do something different. That's not my point. The point is, is that when we do all these amazing things, there's a real person who is alive. His name's Jesus. He's, he's real. It's not like he's in a cloud. It's like he lives inside of us and he's around us. And that as we grow deeper and more in love with him, and as we grow closer to him, and as we encounter him, it changes us. How many have been changed by the presence of the Lord encountering his presence? How many were like, this is, this is unreal, as if it can be this good, you know, to be in his presence and to be delighted in him? How many have found that their love for him has increased? You know, when Jesus, you know, is talking to the churches, he says, you've lost your first love. Well, how did they do that? How did they lose their first love? Get busy. Take their eyes off them. So what did they put their eyes on? On themselves, stuff. Good, good ministry. I mean, again, none of that stuff's wrong, nor is it we're supposed to be engaged in, 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 in being warriors that, you know, speak into the ground, that shake the nation. Yes, we're called to do that. But if, if, if we lose that connection with a real person, you know, his name's Jesus, and that real fellowship, that real connection, and I know it's different for everybody else. Like, everybody has their own kind of way because of how you're wired and how you connect with him. Some really have a strong gift of faith, and they don't have to, you know, feel a lot of stuff. They, the, it's just like faith is just activated in them. There's other people that experience things multiple different ways. And so there's not one is right or one is wrong. Let me ask this. Um, is it possible that... Uh, Getting prayed for on a line and falling over can be a form. And the success of it is, you know, because that's probably one of our more, more common ones, right? Again, it's not, there's life-changing things that take place, but if the goal is the form and not him, all of a sudden there's something's lost, right? Or what about speaking in tongues, you know? It's like, come on, we got to speak in tongues. We gotta, okay, great, you're, you're speaking in tongues. We got the form, but it's the person Jesus that's on the other side of it. And so let's just, um, is this kind of connecting with you? Does this make sense? It's just, I just had a real kind of re-check kind of in my heart this week, you know, this past week with, 
It's, it's, it's easy to get into doing all the right stuff, right? And, it's, and it can be quick. We can be quick to be all of a sudden consumed with what's going on and what's happening in life that we can just walk right past him when he's saying. It's interesting, the story, right, of Mary and Martha when uh, Jesus visited their home. And Martha is like running around the house. Like she's, she's probably feeling like, well, if it was our house, it'd be like, one of their rooms would have to be cleaned up and um, there might be some dishes that should be put away or, you know, that kind of stuff, right? And um, whereas Mary was, she was, she was like, I want to sit at your feet. Like I just, had the, I just had the dignity of all of eternity walk into this room. Everything else doesn't matter. And, and then he looked upon Mary and how, you know, her heart was engaged with him and, um, you know, and that's what pleased him. And so to be in that place of where we can come intimate, you know, intimately uh, at his feet and just sit there, you know, abiding in him. Uh, John 15 is crazy, that whole scripture verse where it talks about abiding in Christ. Who's ever heard of abiding in somebody and producing fruit? Right? Like, like you would think to produce fruit means that we have to gr- have a great plan in place, good strategy, we got to implement it, we got to execute it. But he's saying, just abide in me and you're going to bear fruit. You know, abiding in him. So we're going to take the last 15 minutes. Uh, If we could have the worship team come up. And um, I just want to take a moment to give space and opportunity for connecting with him in in encountering him. And and I'm just going to open it wide up. If, If encountering him is laying on the floor soaking, do so. If it means coming up to the front, we pray for you come on up. If it means pulling out a journal and, um, and journaling, uh, do that as well. Um, if it means reading some scripture. But I just want to give space and place. Because we sang about it this morning. We said, if you walked into this room, and just imagine, if Jesus walked into the room, legitimately walked in as a person, walked in the door, what would he look like? What would his countenance be? What would his posture be? What would be in his eyes? Would you look into his eyes or would you pull away, you know? Or would it be, would you rush for him? Would he be safe? Would, he, would it be exciting? Like, would, you know, I just imagine him as one of the most confident individuals that exist, but yet so meek, so gentle, so tender, so compassionate, but yet so powerful, all in the same. And it's just so mind-boggling because it's like I would want to hang out with him you know, as one of the disciples, they wanted to hang out with him. They were like, they were like, it must have been one of the most craziest adventures ever. Can you imagine being one of the disciples hanging out with Jesus? Like he spits into mud, heals a guy's eyes, right? Like it's just like, who would have thought of that? You know, it's, and then also him getting pressure from these crazy religious leaders that they would have felt very intimidated by or pressed down or oppressed by. And he comes up with these answers that keep them absolutely wordless like they can't even they're stunned you know and and the fact that that he had this overwhelming compassion for people who were sick and people who were burdened and then when can you imagine being in the synagogue when he gets up and opens the scroll to Isaiah 61 and says in front of everybody there like in front of the whole council and he doesn't think twice whether it would offend them or not and he just states the truth and lays it on the line and says, for the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me to preach good news, to, to bind up the brokenhearted. Can you imagine standing there feeling like, this is the champion of heaven and I get to witness it. You know, no wonder they wanted to give up their lives for him. No wonder after he went to the cross and they were faced with great trial, great persecution, All of his disciples laid down their lives for him. I mean, there was substance in who he was that gripped their hearts to the inner core and uh, and the passion for him. How many many, uh, grad students do we have from the school of ministry? I know Jason and Lissa. uh, Are there any other ones that are here? I think just the two. We had four here this morning. And I just want to talk a little bit about the school of ministry in Toronto because what I've observed about the school in Toronto is that there's a lot of great institutions that 
that uh, have biblical teaching. And now a lot of the mainstream universities have gone so liberal with it that I think, you know, they completely missed the mark 100%. And then, but then we have like the school of ministry that it was really because of the revival that took place in Toronto that students started coming from all around the world and went through a full year of, of encountering God and how much he loves them. And I just noticed that with students that come out of it, is that, that their level of confidence, their level of, of closeness to Lord. Bernie, I think you went to the school of ministry, right? Yeah. Would you be all right to come up and share a little bit? I'm putting you on the spot. You can say no. No? Okay. Um, sorry, I should have done that beforehand. Um, they come out, they feel so much more confident and they feel so much more, actually, Jay or Lissa, would either one of you want to share? <laughs> We have freedom in this place to say no. Oh, thanks, Lisa. And they would just go through and 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 learn about um, their identity. And anyway, I'll let you. So you want me to kind of just say a gist, the gist of it? Um, yeah, I would agree with what Trevor is saying. And um, for myself, like one of the biggest things that I which would have helped me in my confidence was really learning how to connect with different people on a heart level, if that makes sense. Um, specifically with my one sister and my mom, just the personalities that they were compared to mine. Um, I was just learning a little about healing your heart and your own heart and how other people can perceive your behavior, how you've perceived people's behavior. That was really healing, and that actually gave me a lot of confidence in dealing with other people and understanding that, like, we just, we actually see things really differently, and so that was kind of a cool part of it. And then I think even just having the confidence of you can get through stuff, you can get over stuff, like, that's a huge thing to know that when you're facing something that it's not forever and that God will see you through to the other side of it. So I think, like, that was... And that's something I still carry with me constantly is just knowing that I have, you know, I have tools to walk through, whether it's pain or offense or disappointment or, you know, standing in faith when you have zero emotion of faith, you know, different things like that, that just that God sees you through. And I think the testimonies of the people that are around you are so powerful too, because you're walking your own journey, but you're also seeing others walk through a journey and get breakthrough, which is really cool. So, yeah. If you know anyone that might need to go, encourage them. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks for your vulnerability and sharing too, Lissa. You know, and that's, you know, that's really the kingdom that we're a part of is that, that when we experience him and when we encounter him, it changes us and it equips us. It's not a, I love what Judah said this morning. He said, the school of ministry helped me realize that it's got to go from my head to my heart. And, uh, and he says, that seems to be a very long journey, you know, at times because we can know a lot of stuff. We can say, I've had that experience or I've had that encounter and go, you know, well, that was something in the past. I've matured beyond that. You know, I don't know, you know, from everything I'm seeing, you know, is that this is a lifetime pursuit of, of encountering his love and his presence. And I always love it when a father heart thing comes up in my heart and I'm like, oh, really? Do I got to do this again? Like, I thought I'd done that. But it's just like he's just going deeper and deeper and deeper, you know, until that my whole inside is absolutely in that place of rest inside of him that, that's not swayed by fear. It's like the destination is to look like Christ, you know, to, to be like Christ and to move like him. And that's, that's a lifetime journey, you know, for, for many of us. So let's stand together and... Um, Father, we thank you so much for your goodness to us and your love. And Lord, I thank you for every single person that's here this morning that's on this inward journey of connecting with you. Because there's an inward, there's an upward, and there's an outward. And, and Lord, as we align our hearts today on the inside into that incredible relationship with you, Father, I pray this morning, God, that there would be encounter with you, Jesus. Life changes.
changing encounter. We need you every moment, every day. It's not just a one-time event. Father, would you draw us into encountering God's transforming presence? justification gives us full confidence to come before your throne as sons and daughters of a living God. God, I thank you that we can come boldly before your throne and that we can find that place of rest in the Father's embrace. Father, we thank you that we can get onto your lap, that we can find that place and space that's inside your heart. And Holy Spirit, I pray for, for those this morning that um, may say, it's been a long time since I've really had a close connection with you. Holy Spirit, would you just make yourself really, really known to each person, Lord? Father, we thank you that it's not about, about our head knowledge and the forms. And even though, Lord, let us not slip into being professional Christians that become part of the elite that think we're better than others, Lord. Father, I pray that there would be a tenderness in our hearts towards those that are broken, those that are hurting, Father. We pray that, that we could be like life-giving to those that are in need. And Jesus, I just pray for your spirit to flood in here, the river of God to come to flow through this house, God, with great joy. Lord, bring your new wine, God, that heals our bodies and heals the diseases. Father, we love you. We love your presence and your goodness to us. Jesus. For some of us, it's, it's been a long time since we've soaked in his presence. The thing about soaking is that um, if you don't soak, it's pretty easy to become, I love how Carol puts it, she's like, a, a, you know, you have this dirty pot that you've cooked with and, and the substance on that pot is really hard and rigid and difficult to clean. But if you soak it, it softens everything and it makes it pliable. And I just feel like, you know, in this moment, we're just taking, we're taking time, we're creating space to allow his presence to penetrate through the pores of our hearts. Please don't run from it or give up. Because his presence is continually wanting to draw us in closer to be with him. The thing about his presence is, it's like what David said, you know my inner being, you know me even, you God, you know me even better than I know myself. I don't even know myself. You know me. And it's inviting somebody into your space, into your place, that knows you better than you even know yourself. He knows your needs before you even know that you have a need. And he's longing to be the one that fulfills and to connect with the innermost part. Some of us may find it hard to be intimate or vulnerable or trusting. That's okay. 
He doesn't come to you demanding or requiring. He comes with a gentleness of his love. It's like an invitation that brings us in until our hearts feels the capacity to trust him. And our being has the ability to be vulnerable with him. So Lord, we open our hearts to you. Father, would you this morning provide the breakthrough between our, our minds and our hearts. God, we wanna be a people that love you, that don't lose the first love. Draw us in closer to you, Jesus. And Lord, I pray, would you teach us, help us, God, with a lifestyle. There's lots of demands of being busy, but Lord, just help us, show us creative ways to cultivate, to nurture, God, this place of, of encounter with you. Lord, thank you for this church. Thank you for this fellowship that we can come to in relationship with one another, in relationship with you, to nurture this encounter with you, the living Jesus that's alive, that's not just found inside the pages of a book, but is real within us. Father, we love you. We thank you. just feel like this morning there's some of us uh, that may have felt frustrated with yourself. Like, man, why don't I get this? Or why don't I experience this? Or why, why, why is it that, you know, I have the capacity to believe God, but why am I, what's wrong with me? So Lord, I just speak to people's hearts that might find it uncomfortable or awkward to be in that place. Lord, I pray, would your melting love, your liquid love, just melt down our defenses, our walls. Lord, we thank you that you are safe, that we can trust you. And maybe there's some, of, some other people here this morning too that feel like, man, I've just drifted from God, you know, like this whole, he was close to me at one time, but I've kind of just drifted from it, you know, I, I kind of like the things that I'm doing and, and just where I'm at. And, and I just pray to God that the Father that I pray that those that may have felt separated or estranged with you, Lord, I pray that your overwhelming, incredible love would just redirect them, realign them, Lord. I pray that, that they don't have to feel like they're on the outside of your love, but that they're on the inside. Lord, thank you for your acceptance. Lord, thank you for when the prodigal son came home, that you were waiting in anticipation for your son, and that when he came running down the, the road, that you ran to meet him. You were waiting there in great expectation, and that you threw your cloak over him, and you created the best feast, the best party for him. Lord, we love you today, and we love who you are. I feel like for some, there's some people here that, that have found great joy in dancing before the Lord in secret and in public, but I felt like the Lord was going to restore that, that passion of dance, that that's a form of, of movement encountering him. So Lord, I pray for, for dance, intimate dance to be restored. We love your presence. If I were to try to articulate what it is that I feel is here, I feel it's like a mist, like a cloud, and it's got this, this kind of weight to it, but it's like a light weight. And I feel like those of you that are open to it, it's just like he's just penetrating. He 
that's just penetrating your mind and your hearts. And so we gaze upon your eyes, Jesus. We gaze upon your beauty. And we say thank you for your beauty. Thank you for, for igniting our hearts in love with you. Thank you, Lord, that we don't have to run from your presence. So we're just gonna, you're welcome to stay and linger as long as you want. The children have returned from the gym and uh